When it comes to powering your electronics projects, then you might be familiar with these three boards. The first one is a buck converter, which can output a variable output voltage lower than its input voltage. The second one is a boost converter, which can output a voltage higher than its input voltage. And the third one is a buck boost converter, which, like the name implies, can output a voltage lower and higher than its input voltage. If you add a 12V switch mode power supply to such a buck boost converter as its input power source and a voltage slash current meter display to its outputs, then this setup is almost perfect for electronics prototyping work, since it acts just like a variable lap bench power supply. The only remaining advantage a proper lap bench power supply has is its current limit feature. That means I can set a maximum output current, which no matter what load I attach will not be exceeded. By doing so, you can save your faulty circuit from destruction, prevent short circuits and can even use it as a constant current source. Now the buck boost converter can only adjust its output voltage, not the current. So in this episode of Hacks, we will have a closer look at the circuit of such a board and see whether we can add our own current limit function to it. Let's get started. A possible topology for such a bug boost converter could look something like this. And if you're interested in the working behavior of this particular circuit, then you can watch my previous video about it. Anyway, the inductor, the diode and the capacitor component of the circuits are all visible on the PCB of the buck boost converter. But the switch, which is usually implemented by a MOSFET or a BJT, is nowhere to be seen on the PCB. The reason is that the main IC, the LM2587 5 amp flyback regulator, integrates the switch, aka the NPN BJT. And while we're at the subject of the datasheet, it is always the first reference point when it comes to modifying a circuit. Now let's fire up the converter, adjust its output voltage to 5V and connect a 15.2 ohm load, which lets a current of 333 milliamp flow. To observe how the BJT inside the IC switches, we can simply solder a wire to its pin 4 and hook it up to the oscilloscope, since that is the switch pin, which directly connects to the collector of the BJT. On the oscilloscope, we can see a PWM signal, whose low voltage potential represents the on state of the switch, in which the inductor is connected to ground, and the high voltage potential represents the off state. Now when I increase the output voltage, the low voltage potential increases, since the inductor needs to save more energy in its magnetic field to allow a higher output voltage and thus current. But if we remove the load from the output, we can see how the duty cycle changes completely and only shows a very small time in which the switch is closed. The reason is that we now only need a very small amount of energy to sustain a 5V output, since pretty much no current is flowing. So in conclusion that means there has to be a feedback system on the output, which tells the IC to increase or decrease the on time of the switch dependent on what load is attached so that the output voltage remains stable. In our case, a potentiometer and resistor are connected in series between the output voltage and ground, and thus builds up a voltage divider. This divided voltage potential then directly connects to pin 2 of the IC, which is the so-called feedback pin. If we have a look at the block diagram of the IC, we can firstly short R1 and remove R2, since we use the adjustable version. And then we can see that this feedback voltage is directly connected to the inverting input of the error amplifier, which directly influences the duty cycle of the PWM signal. On the non-inverting side of the op amp, however, we can see a constant 1.23V reference voltage. To understand how this feedback system works, let's imagine we just had an output voltage of 5V and are now about to attach a big load. 
Now due to the big energy demand, the output voltage would collapse, which means that the feedback voltage would collapse as well. But since the 1.23 volts on the non-inverting input now has a higher voltage potential than the feedback voltage on the inverting inputs, the output of the op amp turns on, which tells the IC to increase the on time of the switch to increase the output energy. It does that until the feedback voltage is again close to the 1.23 volts and swings around this value to keep the output voltage relatively stable. This is noticeable if we look at the output voltage, which is not completely smooth, but instead it shows high and low points, which represents the swinging around the reference voltage. And while analyzing this feedback system behavior, I came up with this additional circuit which should be able to add the current limit function. At first we got a current shunt, in my case a 0 0.1 ohm one, which connects between the negative side of the loads and the output ground potential of the converter. It will create a voltage drop proportional to the flowing current, which I wanted to be a maximum of 0 0.1 volts so a maximum current of 1 amp. Next we got an op amp in a differential amplifier configuration with a gain of around 30. That means that the maximum voltage drop of 0.1 volts will be amplified to a value of 3 volts. Why only 3 volts you may ask? Well I powered this additional current limit circuit with a 3.3 volt regulator since the output of the circuit will later directly connect to the feedback pin, which can only handle a maximum voltage of two times the output voltage. So to use this limit feature reliable even with low output voltages, I went with a low operating voltage for the op amp. Next the amplified voltage connects to the non-inverting input of a comparator, while its inverting input connects to an additional potentiometer. With it, we can for example set a voltage of 1 volts, which would be lower than the non-inverting input voltage at a current flow of around 333 milliamps, and thus pulls the output of the comparator high, which connects to the feedback pin through a diode. Like discussed before, when the feedback voltage is higher than the 1.23 volts, which it is right now, the PWM signal is adjusted until the current value is close to the set 333 milliamps. And this way the current limit feedback circuit is now dominant instead of the voltage feedback system and we pretty much reached our goal we set at the beginning. So I gathered the required components for the circuit and connected them all to one another according to my schematic on a piece of perf board. And if you are interested in creating a similar circuit, then you can have a look in the video description where you can find the schematic, a parts list and everything else important. Once I was done soldering, I added the bug boost converter to the perf board, connected the current shunt in series to the output load and the voltage slash current meter and hooked up the output of the comparator to the feedback pin. After powering the circuits, we can, like usual, adjust the output voltage fluently, but once we start playing around with the current limit trimmer, we can set the maximum output current to which the output voltage has to adjust according to the attached load. We can even set the current limit so low that we can now use this bug boost converter to test LEDs, which is pretty handy. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If so, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Consider supporting me through Patreon to keep such videos coming. Stay creative and I will see you next time.